Okay, everybody, this is Don Wedding. We are recording sync session number three. This is the wine problem. And today, this is the spring quarter of 2017, May the, uh, what is it? May the 16th. So that's, um, that's what we're gonna be talking about the wine problem. And we're gonna do some stuff with neural networks and enterprise minor and Poisson distribution. So we're going to get started here. But um, before we get started, I'm going to address a question that somebody had here. Brian Place. Um, I'm going to first share my screen. Um, just a sec here. Perfect. Okay. And Brian, if we look at the um, just one second here. I'm just clearing up the real estate. Okay, so <laughs> Scott Scott says, can we whine a little bit about the wine? That's a pretty good joke. And you know, it's kind of funny is I've taught this class for three or four years now, and it's not like I've never heard that joke before, Scott. Just making a little joke myself. Um, okay, so uh, okay, so the question that people are asking about is. Um, the data, some of the data makes no sense. So for example, um, people are saying, well, what happens if you get a negative alcohol value or a negative this value or a negative that value? You know, so there's something in there that makes absolutely no sense. Um, the beauty of this data set is you got what you got, okay? And, then, and I'm gonna tell you, this is, it's not like I sat around here and changed them into negative values. This is just the data as it came. And that kind of chose it deliberately because it's crazy. And this is what you're going to encounter in the real world. A lot of times, the only difference between the data set that I'm giving you and data that you're going to encounter in the real world is that right now in this class, you're not going to get a hostile database administrator telling you that you screwed up and that you don't know what you're talking about, okay? So if you were if you were at a wine company, the database guy would be like, no, there's no negative alcohol content. And you would say, yes, there is. And he's going to say, no, there's an error in your program. And then you're going to have this big fight with him over the next couple of weeks. And eventually you're going to show him that there's an error in the database or there's some negative values and he won't know where they came from and he's got no answer for you. And then he's going to just disappear and you're never going to get an answer. So, so basically, I mean, I suppose what I could do if we want to add some reality, Brian, why don't you ask your question again? And I'm going to give you guys a taste of reality right now. So Brian, um, or somebody read Brian's question about the negative alcohol. And anyone? Bueller? Okay. I'll read it in Brian's voice. In general, if something makes no sense, like negative alcohol, then rescale something to make sense, question mark. Okay, and then if I was a real database guy, I would say, there's, you got an error in your program. So then, I guess this wasn't so funny after all. Okay, um, anyways, so the question, Brian, is what do you do now when you encounter something that makes absolutely no sense? Okay, I'm going to give you some things you can do. One thing you can do is take it as it as it is, okay? Maybe if you've got a negative value, it's possible, I don't know, but let's say that these ne that the alcohol values have, you know, values from minus five to plus five. I don't know what they are off the top of my head. Um, heck, we could probably just open up Enterprise Miner and uh, find out what the values are. Um, does anybody happen to know which values uh, are, people are complaining about? And anybody? Come on, people, you can't be shy. Let's see, somebody's got to be on the phone here. Help me out. Um, Brian, tell me, what, which one, which variables don't you like? Wh which one? Can anyone hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Great. Okay, so... Tell me a variable that you guys want to look at real, real quick before we start building any models or doing anything. 
people are saying free sulfur dioxide or total sulfur dioxide. Sorry. Free. Okay, free sulfur dioxide. Let's take a quick look at some of these values of free sulfur dioxide. Anybody see it here on the free sulfur dioxide? Here it is. Oh, oh I see. Look, they got some some real screwy variables here. Okay, and they seems to be, I don't know anything. I don't even know what a free sulfur dioxide is, okay? But apparently, I'm guessing you guys don't like the fact that it can have negative values and I'm guessing that maybe you can't have negative values. I don't know. I don't know anything about wine other than my wife and I like to drink it and then watch, you know, um, uh, Blacklist on Netflix, okay? So, anyways, um, Don, let's say um, – go ahead. I, I just want to give um, probably a very bad opinion, but mm -hmm. – um, from a chemistry perspective, and I'm not sure this is what's happening here, uh, but you can have it a different reactive state. So the negative numbers, because there's an interaction between the acidity, which are, um, the acidity is a balance between two different charged ions, and the sulfur dioxide is, is also a charged ion. So there, there may be some reactive chemistry there where um, that's what they're, they're trying to document with the negative numbers. And I'm, I'm uh, speaking off the cuff. I'm not sure that's what the case is here, um, but that may be what's happening. You know, ironically, that's exactly what I was just going to say. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> No, actually, I had no idea what you were even talking about. But, okay, so the punchline is there could very well be a logical explanation. But let's pretend hypothetically that there's not a logical explanation. Let's pretend that there's something screwy with this data and it can only be positive. Okay, let's just pretend. What would I do in a real-world situation? Okay, one thing you could do is perhaps you could just take the data as is because maybe the guy who had it transformed it in some capacity like maybe he subtracted out the average like maybe the average value of this was oh i don't know um you know 300 so he subtracted 300 from everybody or or what if the average was 500 and he subtracted 500 from everybody so it just shifted it so it's possible that this stuff is just you know hey it, it, it's a it's a it's a valid number. He just scaled it differently. Something else you could perhaps do is um, maybe you can make all of these guys, you know, maybe missing values turn. It, well, there's a lot of missing values here. I mean, if you if you were to make these all missing, it'd be half of your data would be missing. However, that's something else you can do. Let's let's change the scale on this graph. Um, let's make it. 50. Okay, so, okay, well, look at this. Maybe there's not that many negative values. Those are your negative values. I don't know. You could possibly maybe turn them all into missing values and then try to impute them, okay? Um, so there's, there's other things you could do is maybe put them into buckets or maybe there's – I don't know, set them to zero. I, there's things you can do here. Um, and my thought is that when you encounter weird variables, this is the ultimate answer to the question. You think of something that makes sense. If it makes sense and it makes money, it's right, okay? So if you could, if you could think of a way to handle that variable, and it makes sense and you can explain it to your boss or you could talk to a wine guy and they would say, yeah, that makes sense, whatever. If you could think of some reasonable way to transform this variable and you can make sense, there's no right answer to this. I don't even know what the right answer is. I don't even know if these are valid values. I mean, they may very well be. Try use them in their raw standpoint, put them into buckets, um, take an absolute value for all I know. Uh, treat it as a missing value and fix it. Um, try lots of things and see which one works the best. 
if you really don't like this variable, throw it out. I mean, there's no hey, Don. law that's – oh, go ahead. What about just asking a subject matter expert? Like at my company, when I get, when I, uh, get stuck on something, I just go talk – I, you know, I figure out who knows the most about wine, and I go and talk to them. Wouldn't oh, that be a you, good you know thing to if, do as if, well? If you, if you can find yourself a wine expert – see, the problem is not a lot of people have expert, uh, access to a wine expert. It's possible that the wine expert's going to go, this is bad data. But you know what? If I have had people – talk to wine experts, you know, you, you teach this class enough and people surprise you as to what they can encounter. If you can find yourself a wine expert, tell me about it and I'll give you some bonus points, you know? Um, I'll, well, I meant more like, so yeah. like I work at a, a John Deere and we work on tractors. And so when I get confused right. about machine, about tractors, I go talk to my tractor guys and say, Hey, right, you know, right. it's but doing I, and, and, this a whole and, bunch of times. Yeah, no, no, no. I have no problem with you talking to an expert. Although not every time you encounter data in your real life will you encounter will you get um, uh, have access to an expert. Um, for example, the base. You know, I, I tried to give you guys a whole variety of different pro, uh, different industries in this class: baseball, insurance, banking, abalones, whatever. I don't even know what an abalone is, but wine. There's all sorts of different stuff here. You may not have access to a to a expert. If you do, that's a good thing to do. Always use an expert. But if you can't get an expert, then you're gonna have to come up with something else. So does that does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Well, I'm I'm hearing silence here. I'm feeling like I'm losing everybody here. Because I'm, I'm afraid that my self, my, my, my internet connectivity in the hotel is going to drop. So, so I need, I need people to give me some sort of feedback to make sure you guys are all still on the line. Does anybody can hear me? Yep, I we can, can hear, you. hear you. Oh, great. <laughs> just say, yeah. Just give me every now and then, give me a rousing go, Don, or something like that. Help me out here. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay. So anyway, we is, think you're swell. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I'm swell. I haven't heard that word in a while. Okay, um, so anyways, let's. Uh, that answers the question. And let me ask you, answer one other question. Somebody else asked from the last class. They were asking me about um, real world applications of logistic regression and also Poisson. And they. Yeah, hey, asked hey Don. This is this is Rob. Thanks for bringing that up. I, I guess the, the reason why I asked that. Um, I, I think everything we've been doing in this class is quite clear. But everything is also framed up in a very specific um, assignment with with pretty um, pretty narrow guidance. So uh, I know that all these models have very broad um, mm, frameworks and potential. So, Could you just throw a couple of examples at us so we we have that in mind as we work through this some more? Okay, sure. So let's start off with linear regression. Okay, that should be pretty obvious. Anytime you got to predict a number. You know whether or not it's like the, the the sale price of houses, how many wins there's going to be, how many base hits, how many points a football team's going to have. I don't know life expectancy, all of those type of things. Linear regression, you'll be using it all over the place. Okay, logistic regression. If you remember, we had a did the guy crash his car or did he not crash his car? That was a yes or a no. Logistic, you know, you'll be using linear regression all the time, and the other one you're going to use all the time is logistic. Yes or no. You are going to encounter a million yes or no questions in your life, and you're going to. And logistic regression will be your best friend. Okay. Did is it just yes or no, you? or is it also trying to assign a probability of something happening? Because well, that's kind of more what I got out of the. Well, no, 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 no. It's your target variable is yes or no, but logistic regression doesn't give you a yes or no. It gives you a probability that it's going to be yes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So. You end up, is, is the person going to leave? Well, yes or a no, but the, what it, the logistic regression doesn't say yes or no. It says, um, I believe that this guy has got an 82.5% chance of going from Sprint over to Verizon or whatever. You know, it's, it's, that's where it is used all the time. And you will encounter a million yes or no problems, okay? So just any time it's a yes or no, the guy's going to buy, the guy's going to crash his car, he's going to buy Twinkies, whatever, it's, it's always logistic regression 
or decision trees, you can use those guys as well. You're going to use lots of different things, but logistic is, is the workhorse in this area. Poisson, unfortunately, you won't use it that often. The reason why is because you won't encounter problems like this. I sort of threw Poisson at you so that you got sort of a flavor of a more exotic type of regression okay it's probably the third most common one but it's a distant third behind linear and logistic okay but and also the fun the thing is usually for poisson and gamma and a bunch of these other ones a lot of the time you get these real exotic type of regressions if you throw a plain jane vanilla linear regression problem at it or model at it it's going to do just fine and that's one of the things i have you do in this we're going to do poisson modeling and by the way i go hey just for fun run a linear regression even though it violates like every assumption in the book and you know what you still get a pretty darn good answer and it's a hell of a lot simpler than poisson models so just Remember that that you learned this last quarter and this quarter is linear regression is very robust and even when you violate the assumptions it still does a really good job. So, um, so Poisson is just basically going to be sometimes you know where you encounter any type of counting variable. You will do you can do a you'll encounter Poisson but you can usually throw a linear regression at it and do just fine. So does that answer your questions? Yep, that's great. Thank you. Great. Okay. What I want to do real fast before we go into building, I want to show you how to solve it with Enterprise Miner. If you want to know how to do it with code, I've already done it a lot of times in some of the other sync sessions, and I have the code and everything. I go through it step by step by step. I didn't want to go through it one more time because it's like the same thing over and over. I'd like to go through using Enterprise Miner to solve it so you guys again can learn something new. Um, you know, just trying to add to the to the uh, to the library of of um, things that you guys can watch. You know, I want to give you a little more value add here. So what I want to do is I want to talk first of all about neural networks because I had a question about neural networks last sync session. And the nice thing about neural networks is that they um, uh, Actually, our, this class is generalized linear models, okay? And so linear regression, logistic regression, Poisson, all of those guys are just a, a subset of a thing called a generalized linear model, okay? Now, a neural network is generalized linear models on steroids. So if you take a neural network and you cut it down, it just turns into a GLM, a generalized linear model. So I wanted to talk real quickly about neural networks, and then I want to show you why it's a, just a general, it's, it's just a, uh, a generalized linear model, which is what we're talking about in this class. A generalized linear regression is just a special case of a neural network. And I want to show you, so I want to talk a bit about neural networks, and, this, and then I want to show you how you could turn a neural network into a GLM. And I know I've just lost everybody in the class because I don't even understand these. I have have I lost everybody or are you guys um, sort of following kinda and and that's really I'm hoping to, that you guys tell me you're following along. Good so far. We're good. Okay, fair enough. Okay, I want to show you guys what a neural network is because somebody asked about it and I did a talk for some other purpose and I pulled some slides out. Okay, okay, neural network. What is it? It is going to be. It's an. It's it's a machine learning algorithm and it's made of nodes links and layers okay nodes links and layers the nodes are going to be the things that do the math the links are when we multiply it by a weight and the layers are just groups of nodes so that doesn't make any sense i'll show you what i'm talking about in a minute just know we're talking about nodes links and layers okay um I could send these slides to you guys after the class. I'll post them so we don't have to, I don't want to read them to you. But let's just go right here. This is kind of, this is a very, there's a million different neural network architectures, but this is a very basic one. This is a vanilla neural network that the, the, the idea behind it is what all other neural networks are built off of. 
Okay, remember I said the, the circles are nodes and they do math, okay? The lines are links, and this is where we multiply numbers. So I do some math and multiply it and shove it in this guy and do some more math. And then I multiply it by a number and shove it over here and do math. So the circles are doing math, the lines are doing multiplication. These guys are layers. So each, each column is a layer. So what happens is, I'll show you what's going on. I shove two X values, you know, let's say that in this case, it's, it's your, how many stars the wine has and it's sulfur content. So I shove those guys in. I do some sort of transformation of it. I could do nothing. I can just leave it by itself. Or maybe I can take a logarithm. I'm doing something to it, okay? Maybe I do nothing. I don't have to do anything. But anyways, this is where I would do that. Then the value that comes out of these two circles goes into that guy. And when, I, and when I shove them in here, I multiply them by this weight and this weight. And then he does some math. Then I send it into this, this middle guy. So I send his guy into here and here. And I multiply him by a weight, and he does some more math. And then I take those two guys and shove them into the last one, multiply them by other weights and I do some math. Now I can have as many nodes as I want in a layer, and I can have as many layers as I want. This, I just happen to have two inputs, and I've got one hidden layer, and I've got three nodes in there. So I shove the data in, do some stuff, send it to him, do the math, send it to him, do the math, send it to him, and do the math. Okay, now I shove those guys into this guy and multiply by more weights, do some math, and out comes how many bottles of wine I have. That's what's going on with the neural network. This is the general architecture of this guy. Now, incidentally, if you want to know about neural networks, is the more of these hidden layer nodes you have, so if I put in more of these guys, the more of them I have, the easier it is for me to fit my training data. Unfortunately, it also makes it more likely that I'm overfitting. So you want to have as few of these guys as possible. And also, if you want to add more and more layers here, again, it makes it really easy to train. Unfortunately, it makes it like you're going to overfit. If I put lots of these layers here, that's deep learning neural networks. We're not going to talk about that. but um, the more complex the neural network architecture, the more it can fit really complicated data, but you, of course, the payoff is maybe you're overfitting. They tend to use very complicated neural networks in things like voice recognition, pattern recognition, stuff that you really have to have a lot of horsepower and, um, you know, you're willing to pay the risk of maybe you overfit because nothing else is going to solve this problem but a neural network or a support vector machine. Those are the only guys who can attack the problem legitimately. So you're like, okay, I'm running a risk of overfitting, but what else other choice do I have? You don't want to throw a complicated neural network at a problem where you're just trying to figure out if the guy wants to buy Twinkies. You know, I'm sorry, it's not that hard of a problem. Throw a regression at it. Okay, so this is what the neural network is. And just for fun, I'll show you how the neural network trains. So what happens is the neural network, when you train the neural network, what you're really doing is training these weights, okay? So what you do is you shove data in and you expect a certain answer to come out of the neural network. And if you don't get that answer, you shove an error in the other side and he adjusts these weights so that the next time he sees that data, he gets a better answer. So these are the weights. So, so everybody understands that these weights are what we're going to train. Um, give me a, a sign that you guys can still hear me or you're paying attention. Anybody still there? Still paying attention. I got, I got a stupid Any, question. 
There's no stupid questions, but if you have a question, I will answer it. Now, well, this is a question that, I mean, I, I could probably solve on my own, but I, at this level, this neural network, simplistically, say X1 and X2 are two different variables. How is this different um, specifically in the mechanics from a, a type of factor analysis? Well, factor analysis is um, at Factor analysis is when you break X1 and X2, and you're going to break these guys into um, vectors, okay? This guy is not going to do that. This is more of closely related to regression, where you could actually take this neural network as it stands, and just, you know how when you get a regression, you can write a little mathematical formula to describe the regression? Yeah. You, you follow? Okay. This guy here could also be reduced to a mathematical formula, but it's going to be extremely complicated. But it's going to be yeah. very closely related to a regression, but just a complicated okay. one. Okay. So well, that's, okay. So, so I go ahead. Why is okay? G X of A. That so just I'm going to go through the thought process so I know the difference. Um, so uh, G X of, uh, X of A, um, you're saying that's not a vector. That's going to be a, a analogous to a regression formula. Yeah, this is a that's a mathematical. This is a function or a formula. So I'm yeah. going to take this X value and I'm going to shove it in here and I'm going to do something to it. I might do nothing. I might multiply it by one. I might multiply it by 15, I might take a sine value of it, I might take a cotangent, you know, something. I don't know. I'm a, a logarithm. You know, I've got well, yeah, something. In, Go in ahead. a simple form, you multiply it by one. You okay. multiply now, both of those variables by one, and then you're plugging it nope. in. To I might do, I might, I, I might even do different guys. Okay, so then I shove, so let's go back over here. I shove these guys into here. I this guy times w one a and this guy times w two a. I add yeah. them together and I get a variable called x a. X a is this guy plus this guy. Yeah. And now he's x a. And I do something else. Maybe I take a, a I don't know um, take it to the third power. Yeah. I don't know. I'm doing something to it. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to do that. That's, that would be not a thing that you normally do in a neural network, but you're going to do some function to it. Yeah. Then these guys, I, I add them together and I get a guy called XB. Okay. Yeah. It's going to be different from XA. So I add these two guys together and I get XB and then I'm going to do something to him. And then I do a function. Yeah. So does that make sense to you? Well, that's why when when you're talking about describing your your data in terms of of different variables, that's why I said okay, well maybe this is a, in its simplest form is a form of factor analysis. You're taking nope, x1 and x2. Yeah. Nope, it, it, a, closer, uh, a closer analogy would be a regression because that's where I'm going to okay. lead to this is that this is, a, this, is a, this is regression on steroids. Okay. okay? All right. So that, we'll, we'll go there in a second. How about that? We'll, we'll get to there in a second. Yeah, yeah. I want to show you okay. how a neural network is trained. How about that? Can I, can I ask you a quick question on this um, before you move on? Certainly. Um, so one of my one of my main questions with the neural network is is also in what capacity do we explain it in say a paper or to management, and I was wondering if um, we could make sure we cover that as part of this discussion. But I mean, I guess as a first question, should we present some, or provide some kind of diagram like you have here where we explain what no, each of the you, functions are? No. No? no. Okay. You would Thank not. You. you would not ever show this to upper level management. I'll show you a trick about explaining. I will show you a neat trick on explaining a neural network, but you would never show this. Okay. okay I'm showing it. you what's, you. I, I'm opening up the, the, the inner workings of the clock and I'm saying, this is how it keeps time. 
but then I'm going to close it up, and, and you do, now you see Mickey Mouse. You just want to tell time. <laughs> moving right. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. So, okay. So, let's go over, and I'll show you how the neural network works. Okay. Let's pretend right here that I have a zero and a minus one, and I want a minus two to come out. And over here, I got a one and a one, and I want a one to come out. And I put in a three and a minus three, and I want 57 to come out. This is what I want, okay, right here. Now, remember, right here, I've got all of these weight variables, and I'm going to have to train this neural network so that I can get these guys out. So what I do is I take these guys again, and I set them to random starting points. Okay, I start them off as a random number. So I shove in, I put, take these guys here, these are my starting points, my inputs, I take those guys, I slam them into the neural network, and I want this to come out, but this is what came out. And these are my errors. So what I do is I got all these errors here, and I go back, and I adjust the weights. Remember those weight variables? I adjust them so that the next time I get better scores. Then I take these guys again and I sho shove them back into the neural network. I want this to come out, but guess what? I got this stuff instead. So these are my errors. Now you'll notice the errors got a little smaller. So I adjust the weights again. Now, I shove this guys in, I slam them into the neural network. I want this stuff to come out. This is what came out. These are my errors. Now notice they're getting a little smaller. Adjust the weights. Put this in, want this to come out. This is what I get, look at my answers. And then finally, put this in, want this, get this. Oh, they're all zeros. The neural network has been trained, okay? That's how a neural network works. It's a brute force, and he zeroes in on the best answers, okay? And these are the advantages of the neural network. These are the disadvantages of the neural network. Um, and now I want to show you why it's a generalized linear model, okay? Um, I did this talk for some people at SAS. That's why I got the little SAS logo down here. Okay, so this is a neural network. But in reality, here's a generalized linear model, okay? And let's just think of it as linear regression. I put in this X and I put in this Y, or these two guys. I multiply them by one, that's the transformation. Then I multiply it by its weight. I add them together, multiply it by one, then multiply this guy by one, and then, you know, don't do anything. So, so basically, linear regression is just figure out what this guy is and what that guy is. That's linear regression. Okay? Logistic regression is I shove this guy in and this guy in, and I don't do anything. Then I multiply him by these two guys. I add them together again, and then what I would do, multiply it by one, and then over here, I would take the in, so my answer is I've got a logit at that point, so I turn it into this function here is I would take my logit, I would turn it into odds, and then I would turn it into probability, and a probability would come out. So do you see that this guy here is, if I cut away a lot of stuff and I don't do as many things, I can end up with simple regression. Does anybody see that at all? Does anybody, am I still on? Okay, so. Oh, I'm sorry, is, <laughs> hi Don. Yeah, I, I see that. I guess what I'm, what I'm wondering then is like, are the weights here exactly analogous to the betas? Is that nope. what you're saying? Okay. That's exactly what they are. And in fact, I even have a demo that I do used to do for customers when I was at SAS, and I guess I'll show it to you real fast. Um, let me see if I can 
recent projects. It was this guy right here. And what I did was I took a problem and I solved it with a neural network and I solved it with regression. Now what I wanted to show you guys today, it's kind of a neat thing about the neural network, is I was in the wrong guy. Let me see. Just a moment. Okay, one of the things that I did, the neural networks inside of SAS, if you go over here, there's an option, and if you click on this box, you can set it to be a generalized linear model, okay, as opposed to it being a neural network. You just set it, you say, hey, listen, cut away all the other stuff and just make it a single layer neural network and don't do any of the fancy stuff, and it suddenly becomes a regression. And then you say, well, if it's linear regression, my activation function is going to be identity. In other words, don't do anything to it, and my errors are going to be normally distributed. So then what I did for, a, for an example is I said, hey, let's run You know, I've got some, some real simple data here, and I just said, well, let's run, um, let me open this up just a moment. And we wait a second. And I said, okay, just for fun, let's run a proc regression and just make a model Y equals X. And then I did proc gen mod, and I said Y equals X with a link function of identity and the distribution is normal. So this is, this is a, you know, like I told you, regression is a generalized linear model with multiply it by one and have a normal distributed error. And so basically I did all sorts of different regressions here. And then at the same time, I came over here, I clicked on this guy, I told Enterprise Miner, hey, would you please treat him as a, as a you know, cut away the neural network stuff, leave it nothing but bare bones, have identity and have a normal distribution. And then what happened was when he was done, my neural network and my gen mod and my proc regression, these guys are all 100% correlated with one another because I got, they gave me exactly the same answer. My neural network had an average of this and a standard deviation of this. And you can see they were all exactly the same. And I just wanted to show people that, look, a neural network can actually be tricked into thinking it's a regression. And it's another way of doing a regression, um, especially like Enterprise Miner. The reason why I came up with this demo was that at one time, Enterprise Miner did not have generalized linear models. It only had this neural network. So I said, okay, if you got a neural network, you can trick the neural network into thinking that it is a generalized linear model. And so this trick is good for Enterprise Miner. It's not necessary anymore. However, you guys might someday encounter a situation where you don't have a generalized linear model or something you know, in a graphical tool like this, and many times the neural network, there's a way you can trick it into thinking he's a GLM. And I'm just saying this is a neat little trick. So, you know, over here I just said, um, you know, if I wanted to do linear regression, all I do is I tell this guy, hey, you are a generalized linear model, identity, normal distribution of error. If you want to do logistic regression, this is what we did last class, our last unit. You say, I'm a generalized linear model. I want you to do a logistic transformation of my variables. And the error distribution is Bernoulli. Um, gamma distribution, um, that's real popular in the insurance industry. So what is that? That's generalized linear model, exponential activation function gamma distribution. So this is kind of something I've just, just, this is what I wanted to show you guys today is that this is um, one of the options that you have available to you. Um, 
So we'll close this guy and we will go back to our wine project. Does anybody have any questions about what I just showed you? I know I've lost a lot of you. If I have, don't worry. I'm just trying to show you some neat tricks. And if you don't understand this, you should still be able to do the wine problem, okay? So I, I, I'm just trying to give you a little um, interesting lecture on this topic. So does anybody have any, I mean, have I lost everybody yet? I just, I really hope I haven't. Well, let me ask a question. In, in your experience and in your professional capacity, how often do you use these neural networks given how popular they're becoming despite the fact that they're very difficult to explain? Because I guess one of the questions is, these often come up with very accurate models and they're pretty easy to program in something like Enterprise Miner. Why run all the other models that we've been learning around? Why not just do everything with a neural network? Oh, the real reason is because they aren't all that much accurate. The, typically, most problems that you encounter in the real world are not that complicated and you don't usually need to have a neural network. So your neural network is going to be many times just as good as um, a regression in a tree will be just as good as a neural network usually, but the neural network is not explainable, okay? Um, you know, and you can't even use a neural network many times in some industries, like for example, in auto insurance or, or um, in banking, because it's a black box. And if you got a black box and you don't know what's inside of that thing, how does the regulator come in and you're like, oh, I promise I'm not discriminating against people. Well, how do I know that it's a big black box in there? Okay. So there's many times there's, there's legal requirements that keep you from using it. But from a practical standpoint, people usually don't like a model if they don't understand it. I mean, if you can't know, if you don't know what's going on in there, you're just praying that it's that there's nothing crazy happening. In my experience, I have rarely, and I did all my neural net, our PhD work was in neural networks, and I've very rarely used them in the last 20 years. Um, they, they, people use them a lot in fraud. A lot of them are used in imaging and in voice recognition. There's certain areas where you don't have to explain the model and the neural network is perfectly fine. You start getting into things like, What's a customer going to do? It's, I don't just care about what the customer is going to do. I want to know why he's going to do it. You know, what, what is it about the leave. problems for which the neural networks are particularly useful? What, what is it about those problems that make the neural nets so good? Because it's not volume of data, because as we've seen with some of these other models, they can handle volumes of data. Is it complexity of interaction? Or yes. what, com, com, it's complexity and interactions if there is a highly complex transformation in the data that you will never find on your own in a million years or complex interactions. This is such a complicated black box and he's multiplying everybody together and he's adding them and stuff. It's, he's just gonna find the, the complexity of this thing. If you have a very complex interaction or weird transformations, the neural network does a great job. However, in the real world, many problems are linear or, or quadratic. It's, it's just, you can usually do a heck of a lot with something as simple as linear. Does that answer your question? Yep, definitely. Okay, so let's, let, uh, let's do the wine problem real fast. Okay, so this is our friend, the wine data. And the first thing I do with Enterprise Miner, and the first thing, if you guys are playing around in R, you should always do this. The first thing we're going to build the model with is, anybody want to guess what's the first thing you're going to build? Decision tree. Decision, Decision tree. tree, right. Okay, who said that? They get a bonus point. Uh, it was Steve. <laughs> I don't know who said it. I'm just kidding. Okay, what I always do is a decision tree. Bam. Drop them in there. Let's see how he does. Oh, actually, let's let's have a holdout sample too. You don't have to do a holdout sample, but we're going to. Okay, decision tree, bam. Um, let's say that we're going to use 70% of our data for training. Nothing for validation. The rest will be test. 
okay, we got a decision tree. Let's see how good this guy is. And every now and then, let me know you guys can still hear me because I have a feeling I'm, I'm going to lose connection soon. So can you guys still hear me? Yep. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. Yeah. So decision tree, I love decision trees because they can handle missing values, they can handle outliers, and all that kind of fun stuff. And then after this, instead of going into, well, I'll do a Poisson real, real fast, and then um, I'm going to do a neural network and show you how to explain it. I'm going to show you one of the, the tricks of the trade, okay? And if you forget everything else about this class, remember this trick that I'm about to show you, because you're going to be, it's just going to be life changing. Are you going to wave your hand? I'm not. Yeah, I'm not going to wave my hands. Who said that? Is that Brian? No, it's Scott. Scott. Okay. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to. This is going to be such a life-changing event for the neural network that I'm about to show you that if it doesn't change your life, Scott's going to give everybody on this phone call seventy-one dollars. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and that's. And so, so would I be this quick to spend money or spend Scott's money if I wasn't so sure that I was right? I don't think the check is in the mail because it's not your money. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. It's, I, I still, I'm still, I, I stand by my assessment. Scott, Scott's going to be sending money to everybody here. Okay, so <laughs> we build the decision tree. Let's take a real quick look at him just for fun. So the stars apparently is the most important variable. Um, so if it's less than one or it's missing, then the number of cases of wine goes from three down to one. If you got lots of stars, you go from three cases to four, label appeal, there's all sorts of variables here. Okay, fine, that's what we got. Um, we're gonna choose Selection statistic, we're going to choose the best model. We'll do mean squared error, and we're going to look at the, tra the test set. Okay, let's run this guy one more time. Then we're going to build. Um, so let's just see how good the, the tree is, because the tree is going to be our, our baseline here. See how good a model it is. Now, remember, the tree's not all that sophisticated, but let's see. And wait, 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 and so the tree is on our uh, our test data set. Well, I thought we should be doing test data set train. Um, oh, here it is selection train. I, was, I thought we said test. Didn't we say test? Yes, we did. Selection table, test. Huh. Oh, well. I thought it, it should say test here. I'm sorry. Oh, well. You think they would have worked test. the bugs out of it before they rolled it out? Yeah, you would think, wouldn't you? Okay, here it is. 1.36. I'm going to, we're going to have to send a, a, a strongly worded letter to Dr. Goodnight. Okay, so the average squared error is 1.87 cases of wine. And the root mean squared error is 1.3. So you're off by 1.3. Okay, so let's build something else. The first thing we have to do is we got to fix our missing values. So let's go over here, impute. Let's just impute with the average. And one of the things I like to do is I like to use a flag variable. Because if I, sometimes the fact that it's missing is highly predictive. So what do we do? We're gonna come over here and we're gonna, we're gonna fill in the missing values with the average, the mean. But if I fix it, I'm gonna set a flag to one. That's not here, that's, yeah. 
unique, and that's going to be an input variable. Okay, so here I'm fixing, and this is something I've done in the last two sync sessions. I don't want to go into this again. This is just what we're going to do. We're going to fix this guy. Um, can you guys still see and hear me? I can hear you, but I'm not yeah. seeing your screen refresh or move. Uh oh. Let's let me. I think I. For some reason. I can see your screen. You know what I fine. think? You can see my. You know what? I think I think I dropped on the internet. Just a second. Let me see. I could. I might have. Give me a second. I may. See, I was afraid that. Give me a second here. I think I lost my connection to the internet. I'm still talking on the phone, but this is good. This is good. Yep, here it is. I have to get back into the internet. I blame the, who did that, that big giant um, ransomware thing? It was, uh, wasn't that all over the news or something? The NSA made it, so. They did? Yeah. Uh, then they released, they told that Microsoft after, about it after they found out that it got stolen. I did not know that. Well, see, there you go. See, I learned so much from this class. Now, if I tell this to my friends, they already think I'm a nut to begin with. And they're going to think I'm like a tinfoil hat kind of guy. Um, okay, let's let's see if I can get back into. Can you guys see my screen at all? It's not moving or updating, is it? No. Okay, give me a minute here. Um, let's see if I can get into blue jeans. Reconnect. Oh no, something went wrong. Reconnect. Let's see if I can reconnect. How did you run trees before Enterprise Miner? That was one of the first things you did because it's difficult to do in SAS, right? Yes, it is. But if you were going to do it in, um, can you guys see, I, I think I'm back. Let me see if I can share my screen. You're back in the participants list. Can you see my mouse moving around? Yeah, now I see it. Yeah. yeah perfect. Great. Okay. So I've filled in my, I'm going to fill in my missing values and I'll show you what I got just for fun. Now I got all the time in the world here because, um, I wonder if I'm still recording. Ooh, that's a good question. Let's see. Recording is on. Okay, good. So just for fun, Enterprise Miner is automatically doing something that you guys would be doing by hand, and it ain't fun to do if you've got a 500 variables to fix all of the missing values. But guess what? If you're going to do it by hand, it's going to take you a while to do. Um, that's why getting a tool I'm gonna... like Enterprise – go ahead. No, sorry. I didn't want to interrupt you. Please continue. Oh, no. I was just going to say the, that you're going to want to have a graphical – tool if you can get a hold of one do it even if it's something like rattle or something if, if you can ever do it because in the real world you usually get a lot of variables and it's not fun to do this by hand but you were about to say something and what was it well yeah i was going to ask everyone on the phone um anyone who has a view has anyone found anything like enterprise miner in r because the more I explore with Rattle, I think you can do a variety of things like you've showed us with Enterprise Miner, but I'm by no means an expert. Any other good packages out there for R that let you do a lot of this stuff automatically? Because obviously it's a huge time saver when you can just hit a few buttons and so much of your missing data is populated, et cetera. I, I, I don't have any examples in R, but there is, I, would say that there is a pitfall to be to being able to just hit a button and having things populate um, because at some level you kind of have to get to know the data and at least look at the data. But mm -hmm. no, I definitely know, think that's right. It's definitely going to be, you know, 
I wouldn't say it'll ever be fully automated to where you push a button, but possibly, you know. I'm, I'm not saying it, it won't happen. There's always interns. No. Yes, there's always interns. No, and, and to go to your, your previous point is in the real world, I would not be just collecting boxes and hitting run. That's, that's the recipe for disaster. You've got to crawl around in the data. Um, here's another um, I should put this on the final exam because I say it all the time. Um, a tool in the hands of an idiot is a weapon, okay? If you guys are just pushing buttons and saying, here's a model, you're going to cost your company billions of dollars. You've got to crawl around in this data and love on it and really learn it. Okay, so anyways, let's look at alcohol. Notice that alcohol has oh, negative values in there. Wow, okay. So you're right, this, this did have some negative values. Um, what I would do with the negative values is maybe um, turn them into missing values. I don't know. So maybe you do that. Maybe, maybe, take, maybe there was an error. I'd explore to figure out what the heck is wrong with this negative stuff. Is there any weird correlation between this guy and the target? Like, um, I don't know, let's take a – well, in, before we do that, I've got this, um, this guy right here. And you can see I had some missing values originally, okay? So what did Enterprise Miner do? Well, he did a new variable called the imputed alcohol. And what he did was he said, well, if it's missing, I'm going to fill it in with an average value. So these guys all got put over here in the average. However, he also created a flag variable. And if he fixed it, it's set to 1. Otherwise, it was set to 0. Okay, why? Because sometimes the very fact that a variable is missing is highly predictive. Go back to the last unit where we had the home equity line of credit. If you don't have a debt to income ratio and it was missing, that was highly predictive of you not paying us back. Why? Because if you don't have a debt to income ratio, that means you probably don't have a credit history, which means you probably changed your ID and your commitment fraud okay so there's sometimes missing data is extremely predictive it's like that episode of Sherlock Holmes where the dog doesn't bark because the dog the guy who's the killer was actually owned the dog so the dog didn't bark and then that, that's how they knew that the dog the, the killer was the guy who owned the dog so and as always spoiler alert so don't you know if you didn't see that episode of Sherlock Holmes you now forget that I said that. It's like when I say that Rosebud was the guy sled in Citizen Kane. You know, it ruins the whole movie for you. So don't um, don't pay attention sometimes. Um, okay, what what version of Sherlock Holmes are you talking about? Are you talking about the um, Benedict Cumberbatch version? There's an elementary <laughs> version of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, there, there's a lot of Sherlock Holmes out there. You need to be more. Oh, I don't know. This is like there's like a book that that we had to read in high school. It was like the mysterious incident of the dog or something. I don't know if they made it into a movie yet. Benedict Cumberbatch and all you you kids in your modern DCRs and and Walkman and all that stuff. I don't. I can't keep up with the technology and stuff that you guys are talking about. Like rock and roll music is the you know like you kids I'll tell you. So anyways, I, one of the, I I must have lost contact. Nobody nobody even laughs at me anymore. So I must have lost contact. We can hear you. The, the, the internet connection isn't as good in the '80s, so we all just like, I, <laughs> ouch. <laughs> Okay, I've got, I've, I'm, I've got a mullet, guys. You, you probably, you, since you can't see me, I have a mullet and and um, stonewashed jeans. Okay, anyways, so, so at this point, we've got all of our variables have been fixed. Just for fun, let's go over here to the explore button, and let's just grab this guy, variable selection. He, he will choose the right variables for us. 
Okay, so he, uh, no, wait a minute. This guy does nothing more than looks for variables that are highly correlated. You know, so he, he'll do variable selection for us. I haven't used this all quarter. I thought I would just show it to you. Okay, because we don't, you don't want to just dump every possible variable into the model. So we're just, this guy's only going to take the, the variables that he thinks are useful. Um, in fact, if I run this, Is it me or is this taking too long? Okay. And then we're going to show you this trick with the neural, a couple of tricks with neural networks in a minute. Okay. So let's bring over, let's do a real neural network. And I'm going to just build a neural network. So who do you guys think is going to win, the decision tree or the neural network? Neural network. Okay. He may very well win. <clears throat> do you think it's going to be a slaughter or do you think it's going to be close? What do you think? Close. In between. Don't you, don't you need to normalize the values for a neural network for it to be effective? Um, I think this guy does it automatically, but the neural network, uh, typically you are correct. The neural network should normalize or you, should, um, you shouldn't have any outliers, although a lot of times these neural network software will take care of a lot of that stuff for you. It's in the good old days when I was in college, you had to do, and, and we were writing this stuff by hand because it didn't exist. So we'd have to write stuff up in Fortran. You had to normalize this stuff. But unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, over time, a lot of this housekeeping work is being done and it promotes lazy behavior on people like my part. I don't even check to see if it's normalizing. If I get a bad answer, I, then I start poking around, but I just assume that the neural network's gonna do it for me. But let's see how this guy worked. Okay, so the neural network actually, well, let's see who did better. Um, where's my root mean squared error? Huh. Why didn't the tree give me an answer? Oh, here we go. Test, root mean squared error. So the neural network got a 1.2 and the decision tree got a 1.3. So the decision tree's prediction is off by 1.3 bottles of wine and the neural network is off by 1.2 bottles of wine. But the difference is the decision tree I can explain, the neural network I can't. But if we were to give this guy a really complicated problem, I mean, because if, if look at what we're really looking at here. How, buying bottles of wine what do people, when people decide to buy wine, what do they do? They look at how many stars it was given. Did it have a pretty label? Did it have another pretty label? Did it have more stars? I mean, we have to go like four or five levels down before the, the sulfates even kick in. I mean, people don't buy wine. Very few people buy wine knowing how many sulfates are in there. They buy the wine if it's a pretty label, okay? That's what a lot of people do. A neural network isn't gonna be able to give you an advantage, but if we were to do voice recognition, the neural network would be great. Now, John, well, uh, go ahead. Can I interject something? Okay. Of course. In, in um, the, the, the food industry, and we're talking about fresh produce, uh, it, this may extend to wine. I'm not uh, entirely sure. People in general purchase the first time based on looks, and they purchase the second time based on taste. So there's a differentiation between, um, of course, impulse purchases 
and versus uh, versus repeat purchases, mm-hmm. which may be well explained by a neural network. Oh, you may be very well right. And then we would what I, you would ultimately have to do for something like that is maybe break the data set into two groups, and then build a model for the the repeat person versus the new person. And in fact, incidentally, one of the things that you will find is that a decision tree in a situation like that would actually outperform the neural network because you've got two different populations. The tree would split, would instantly say, oh, new guy and old guy behave differently. The tree would instantly split on that and realize that, that there's two different populations. And then Usually, when I'm, if I'm building a model in the neural network and a tree beats the hell out of everybody else, that usually is a sign to me that the, that the, that there's different two populations merged together. Then I split them up, and then suddenly the neural network does great, you know, because he says, okay, now that I've thrown away these new purchasers and it's all this complex taste stuff, the neural network might do a great job after that. So, anyways. Um, I'm going to show you guys how to explain a neural network in a second, but I showed you this node. What does this node do? This is called the variable selection node. It's here in SAS, but lots of different software tools have something like this. If you poke around long enough, you'll find one. I don't know what it's called in R, but I would bet they have something like this. What does this guy do? He takes all of these variables one at a time, like acid index, citric index, and he says, is this correlated to the amount of bottles of wine? If it is, he keeps it. If not, he throws it away. So that's what he got. Let's see how many variables actually made it into. See, this is what actually makes it to the neural network. It's a much smaller list. Why? Because SAS went through using brute force and he went through and he checked every one of these guys for correlations. If it's a high correlation, he kept it. And if it's a low correlation, he throws it away. So this is a good way of um, taking lots of variables down to a small list because you don't want to throw a lot of garbage variables into your model. So ultimately, the acid index, the label appeal, the, the number of stars and whatever a volatile acidity is, you know, that's the stuff that people look at. I would have thought alcohol would have been important, but apparently it's not. But, you know, so this is kind of the neural network gets um, just the primo variables to work with. Now, how would you explain this? Okay, if you want to look at the mathematical formula in here, it's a nightmare. Here it is. Here's the SAS code inside of here. So, you know, he's, he multiplies this guy and adds this, and then, you know, he, you know, this is what he does to the variables when they walk in the door. Then he multiplies each of these guys by new variables. Then he adds them together. You know, he just keeps adding them and multiplying them and performing functions on this stuff. And and it gets to be a very complicated problem. I can't even explain what's going on. And when he's all done, he's running a hyperbolic tangent on this thing. I mean, I'm sorry. I can't explain what's going on here. This is not explainable. Okay, so how would you explain this to your boss? Well, I'm going to show you a little trick here. So let's open up the SAS code. Well, actually, let's do this. What we're going to do is we're going to grab this guy, the metadata node, and connect him. Okay, so be very careful and watch what I'm doing here. So the neural network has run, and he's got a prediction variable. So he's predicting, you know, uh, how many cases of wine somebody wants. This will be this. This is going to be life changing. Remember, Scott's sending everybody 
was it Scott or was it um, or was it uh, um, Brian? Brian, you're supposed to send everyone seventy dollars, right? Seventy-one. Is anybody? 71. Hmm. Seventy-one dollars. That's right. Okay. So here's all of his variables. And remember that we were predicting target, and this is what SAS predicted. So this was our target. This is how many cases of wine people had. Had this many, you know, this was the action, this was the, we, we had three, we sold three cases of wine, but SAS, um, you know, predicted that there would be 3.7. This guy had four, he predicted 3.6. There was five, he predicted four. So this is what really happened. This is what SAS predicted using the neural network, okay? Now, what do I do? And you can also see that most of the variables have been rejected. He only used these variables, these five variables to figure out how many bottles of wine. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I've got this metadata node, and the first thing I'm gonna do is this is what I'm predicting, right? So I'm gonna change that, and it's gonna be my new target. And then my old target, I'm gonna reject it. So now, this is what I predicted it to be, and this is a target, and these were the variables that I used in the model, these input variables up here at the top. So, he's on, so then what I do is I grab myself a decision tree, and I run it. So I can't know what's going on in that neural network because it's so doggone complicated. However, I do know what's going on in the decision tree. So what I do is I take whatever comes out of this neural network and I try to predict it with a tree and I use the tree to explain what the neural network is doing. It's not gonna be perfect, but it's gonna be pretty good at least to give you an idea. So let's see, I, I don't know what's going on in the neural network, but I can explain this to my boss. Is this making that's, any sense at all? Yeah, that, that, I'm super impressed. So you don't have to send me $71. <laughs> you know what? I think, I think Brian is the kind of guy that will send you the $71 anyway. Aren't you, Brian? That's okay. You're totally off the hook, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So... If you look at this guy, we went from three bottles of wine to one bottle of wine. Why? Let's take a look at, let's look at the display the English rule. So if I filled in, so if the imputation indicator for stars was one, in other words, if the star value was missing, and I had to fix it, then guess what? The number of bottles of wine drops significantly. So this means that if, if I didn't have a star rating, I didn't get any bottles of wine sold. So this says to me, people won't even buy wine unless um, somebody else has rated it. Okay. So now over here, I did have a rating. Now we look at the stars, okay? So if I if I did get a um, uh, uh, if the guy did get a rating, then we look at how many stars you got, and you can see that if I've got lots of stars, I buy and sell more wine, and if I got not a lot of stars, I sell less wine. And if the label is a cool-looking label, I sell more wine. If it's a 
stupid looking label, I sell less wine. So that's kind of what's going on. If you, if you look at this guy, um, you can even look at the actual rules themselves. You, um, it should be somewhere around here. Um, known rules, let's see. Yeah, here they are. So you could say that if, if the volatility is, is great and the label appeal is small and I, I did, nobody rated the wine and the acid index was small, then you're not selling any wine. You know, this is, see, so you can just, this guy comes up with some rules. Now you can, I'm sure that, that R has something similar to this or Python or something, but the point is you can come up with some nice English rules. There's a lot of them here. And maybe you can't show all of these to your boss, but maybe you could say, the boss will say, what kind of wine sells lots of bottles? And then you would look over here for, you know, big numbers. And you, he would say, well, what kind of wine do we want to sell? And I don't know, let's look for a big bottle. Right, right here, six bottles of wine. Good label appeal, lots of stars. Um, that's it. Pretty label, lots of stars. There you go. Tastes good and it looks pretty. That's it. You know, what about this one? Looks pretty and lots of stars, but not as many as this guy. You sell a little bit less wine. So the, the more, the high, high if the, the wine has lots of stars and it's a pretty label. So that says to me that you probably um, want to invest in if you're the wine dealer, you probably want to invest in a good artist to come up with a cool label. You have, obviously, you have to have wine that tastes good, but you got to also get somebody to taste the wine and rate it. Because if you don't even get somebody to rate it, nobody's going to drink it. So this is just, you know, something I would pick up from the neural network. So does everybody see kind of how I did this with the neural network? You use the tree to explain the neural network. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Was that life changing or not so much? That's. <laughs> I'm hoping you say it's life changing, guys. <laughs> it's it, one of my it, best. It, so it, I guess it's supposed to be instantaneous. I mean, maybe it'll kick in tomorrow. I don't. I don't know. Do you have a time period <laughs> so we can judge. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I was going to say, couldn't I get the same rough idea by doing a decision tree after variable selection? Or what's happening in the neural network that's making, making the difference? Well, the neural network is building a model, okay? You probably could. I mean, I, I, that's very possible that this guy here um, may just be just as good. But what I'm doing here is I've changed my target so that my target is not truly the real target, but it's the, what the neural network is. So I'm building a model on what the neural network predicted. Okay, that makes sense. So, so if, you want, if, if you held a gun to my head and said, what do you think is going to happen if you do this, I would bet this tree is going to look an awful lot like this guy. May not be exact, but I bet you this is, well, hell, let's run it. I mean, it can't hurt. So it's just, I'm just curious what happens. But then we, I haven't even shown you guys Poisson yet. We spent most of our stuff on neural networks tonight. But hey, this is fun, right? Hey, Don, while it's running, um, okay. there's a, a lot of news um, in the press uh, lately about reinforced learning mixed with um, risk analysis as outperforming neural networks. Um, do you, can you shed any light on the mechanism that differentiate those two? No, because I don't really know what those are off the top of my head, and I would just be making something up, which I'm not averse to making stuff up, but I, I don't know anything on that topic. I'm sorry. 
Um, I reinforce learning. I can tell you this, okay? This is going to sound cynical um, and like that grumpy old man on Saturday Night Live, but um, the reality is this. When I was working at SAS and I would go around the country and demoing Enterprise Miner and talking and building models with companies and stuff, um, every single year or two, there'd be something new. It'd be like, does Enterprise Miner do gradient boosting? And then I was like, what's gradient boosting? I didn't even know what it was, you know? And, and the answer is no, and what is it? I don't even know. And so then SAS has a scramble and they would get it in there. And cause, cause every customer would ask me gradient boosting, gradient boosting. And then we would get it in there. And by the time we get it in there, it would move on to something else, random forest, support vector machines. It was always, and I started calling it the analytic flavor of the month. There's always something new and great that's just wonderful. What it really happens is somebody comes up with some new idea and they run it and it works for some things and it'll not work for other things. But it, it, it's kind of like gradient boosting. Gradient boosting, when it first came out, everybody had to have it because it was the best thing since sliced bread. And then people started using it and they realized, hey, this kind of sucks and then they would stop using it. And then all of a sudden people went, okay, it's not perfect and it doesn't stink. It's good at doing X. And then they would start using it for something. You know, in other words, it will find a home. It will, there's, there's very rarely one of these panaceas that just can build any kind of model. It's, um, the reality is there's a reason that regression and trees have been around for hundreds of years. It's because they work, okay? And you will get a better model by doing good data analysis, good transformation of the variables, good exploration, all that boring stuff that is no fun, you're gonna end up um, with a better model and it won't matter what kind of architecture you use or, or technique. Um, it's kind of like this. I would love it if I looked like, you know, um, you know, I'm trying to think of one of those, those, you know, Michael Phelps, okay, the, the swimmer, you know, if I, if I go to the beach and I look like Michael Phelps, I would be really happy, you know, but I don't look like that. I look like the very dough boy, okay, so now, if I wanted to look like Michael Phelps, I should probably not sit around on the couch eating Doritos and, and, and watching Batman, okay? That's not a good idea. But I want to watch Batman, and I want to eat Doritos, okay? So I look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Um, and I constantly like, well, eat this diet pill, you know, or 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 – I don't know, get one of those things that shakes you real, you know, and makes your fat go away. They say it's going to work, but it doesn't. If you want to look like Greg Louganis, you got to exercise and eat right. And nobody wants to hear that, but that's the truth. And it's the same thing here with this. If you want to get good models, you want it. You got to do good exploration of your data. You got to study it. You got to talk to domain experts. You got to transform it. You got to do all the boring stuff, and then you put it into something like a neural, uh, like a like a regression or a tree, and you're going to be fine. So, does that help you at all, or did I just ramble and confuse you with a with a pointless analogy here? I'm hearing stunned silence. Makes sense. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, okay. So let's take a look at our friend, this tree. Look, the tree also, that indicator, only he looks at acid index and not label appeal. So um, there's some slight differences, but the tree, the, the, this guy here is explaining the tree. This guy is explaining the, the true target. So that's this is what helps you get explain what's going on in the neural network. Um, let's just for fun do a Poisson model, and we'll do it just the way I showed you earlier. Let's grab a model, our friend the neural network. Let's grab him, and we're going to rename him to Poisson, and. 
what are the settings for the Poisson model? If I want a Poisson model, I'll, I'll post this stuff later. The Poisson model, it has to be exponential and Poisson distribution. Okay, so let's take this guy. And what we do is we come over here, click on network. And it says multi-layer perceptron. That's just a way of saying neural network. So when I click on this guy, I scroll all the way to the top and it says generalized linear model. Then I scroll down here and the activation function, we want the activation function to be exponential and we want the error function to be Poisson. So we do activation function is exponential, error function is Poisson, and where's Poisson? There it is. And voila, we've now tricked this neural network into thinking he is a generalized linear model. And I'll show you one other thing, and then we will call it a night. I've had you guys on the phone now for, whoa, how long have we been on the phone? Two hours? No, uh, we've been on an hour and a half, okay. Yeah, but you disconnected for like five, ten minutes, so you gotta subtract that. Okay, fair enough. Well, I hey, see my um, clock here. Going? Okay. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm kind of struggling with is, you know, it's all, it, we only went from you know, 1.3 bottles of wine to a 1.2 bottles of wine predictor for the neural network. But that's a 10% improvement in, in model performance. So mm -hmm. how do you quantify, like, you know, when is model performance improvement, you know, worthwhile for the complexity? Well, Does that make sense? Yeah, and I would say that I would look at the domain. Um, I would, looking at this right here, um, you know, you, you can't have a 0.2 bottles of wine. So it's going to be one bottle of wine or two bottles of wine or one case of wine or two cases. So in something like this, I would be willing to bet that that little extra accuracy is not going to be worth anything just because it's of no use, okay? If we were talking about something like, um, you know, we're – we're selling, I don't know, Lamborghinis. And instead of it being 1.3 and 1.2, we were at, you know, 120 versus 130. What was that? Oh, sorry. Then, Nothing. Oh, I, thought I, I thought I missed it. Sorry. So, so then you look at like 120 and 130 Lamborghinis. Well, they're worth a million dollars a piece. And 10 Lamborghinis is probably a lot of money. So, so I would look at something like that. Again, that's a 10% improvement. But in one case, a case of wine is not really that big a deal. And besides, I can't even split 1.2 to 1.3, whereas Lamborghinis, I go 120 to 130, that's suddenly major. You know. So I think it's really, don't look at it like I'm going to give you some hard and fast rule. I would say if you want to be an analytic street brawler, you got to step back and go, is this worth it to me? You know, and there's no right answer and there's no wrong answer. Okay. I don't have an answer to give you. Okay. And anybody who ever gives you that answer is, is lying to you or probably they're lying to themselves. It's you I, you can probably make a very good judgment on your, by yourself. It's just, you have to have faith that you're good at it. You know, it takes a, it takes a little time to realize that, that you're good at this. So my, my earpiece is about to die. So I don't know if, uh, can you guys still hear me? Uh oh, yes. can you hear me? Oh, okay. Yes. yes. I'm getting that, I'm getting that nasty gram, you know, battery low. So I, I'm running out of time guys. 
Um, okay, so let's see what I got here. Um, Poisson, neural network decision tree. Let's see how they all performed. Um, so my neural network, I think, is still... My, my neural network, then my Poisson, then my decision tree, but there's not really a hill of beans worth of difference between any of them. Um, one other one I want to show you real fast is this, no, this guy right here, high performance data mining. I don't know if you guys have access to, this is my PC version of, of Enterprise Miner that um, I have because I worked at SAS. I don't know if you guys have access to this node um, in SAS on demand. But if you do, click on this and... Hey, Don, we do. Guys. You do, good. High performance GLM. You click on this. This wasn't here when I was a kid, okay? So you guys got something new. And if you click on this guy, He's a generalized linear model, and you can go, okay, so then you do, let's rename this guy, and we'll call him zip model, okay? Now, when you do this, he's just a regression node, and we can say, let's make him a zip model, zero inflated Poisson, and so I think interval target, I think the link function, I think you leave it as log. For this guy, you leave it as log and you make it zero inflated Poisson. Um, the one problem with these high performance nodes is sometimes when you connect them over here, SAS doesn't recognize them. I don't know why. I, I have a workaround because when you work with this tool long enough, you find where all the bodies are buried, and then you find the workarounds, because when you're in front of a customer and things don't work, it's not fun. So when you're, if, you're a, if you're an analytic demo monkey, it's kind of like being a fighter pilot, okay? Fighter pilots are, they say it's like hours of boredom and moments of terror. Well, when you're like a systems engineer and you're, demoing software. It's just the opposite. It's, it's hours of terror and moments of boredom. I think my earphone just went out because nobody laughed at my joke. <laughs> <laughs> now I hear I pity just, laughter. The fat fighter pilot. <laughs> see, okay. Now you see that it wasn't there, right? So that zip model we just created is not there. So what you got to do, this doesn't always work, but sometimes it does. Get rid of this guy. Come up to model, and you find model import. And you put him in there. So in other words, you build a model, and then you import it. So you're tricking SAS into thinking that you've just imported a model from another language. And this sometimes works. So what we're gonna do is cross our fingers and pray that this works, because I wanna look like a, a hero in front of my students. Okay, cross your fingers, touch wood, and I don't know, Get a horseshoe or I don't know. Let's see if this one works. Now, even though this stuff is really super easy, I do expect you guys to do at least one model the old fashioned way with SAS code and a gen mod and all that other stuff. Do it the hard way once so you can appreciate this because knowing how to write that code is important because many times you're going to go to a company and they'll have SAS, but they won't have enterprise minor. Okay. This is, this product is not cheap. So let's see if it works. Hey, look at that guys, model import. 
But what you want to do is rename your model import zip. Okay, and then you can do other ones too. Um, let's. Uh, Oh, by the way, I think this guy also does variable selection. So you can do stepwise selection. And if you want, we can do something else, like let's go grab uh, one more of these dudes. Um, where is it? GLM. And let's make this guy a... Um, whoops, let's do a zero, let's do a negative binomial model, okay, and we'll do a forward selection just to be cool here, negative binomial, And let's go over here to model. Let's get a model import node. Connect him. Rename him. Neg bind. And let's hope this works. It may not, it, we're tricking Enterprise Miner with this guy into thinking that, you know, in, into, thinking he's importing a node, it may or may not work. So this is this is like a what they call a logical band-aid. I'm slapping into the program to, to make it work the way it's supposed to. So one of the things you guys can do is maybe use a decision tree to explain you know, throw a neural network in there and then use a tree to explain it. You know, just have a little bit of fun with the uh, with the final homework. I mean, I mean, I hope you guys have figured out by this point in the quarter, you know, if you stretch yourself on these assignments, I give you bonus points for that. I mean, you're going to teach yourself a heck of a lot more than I can ever teach you. But you got to push yourself. So as this is running, does anybody have any questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah, I had a question. If if there is enough time, um, in, in one of the two PowerPoint documents for this unit, uh, you have some that model validation code at the very end. I, I was wondering if we mm -hmm. could very quickly run through that. Okay. Um, sure. Let's well here. So this is it. Negative binomial zip. This it's all in there. And if you want, guys, you can even grab the the code, the scoring code for this stuff, just like anything else. Um, score code. If you want the negative binomial guy, for example. Run. There we go. And so you can grab the code, and this is exactly what we've done all quarter long. But you wanted to say, well, let's just make sure that it creates the score code here. And there it is. This is, he first fixes the missing values for you. And then here's your negative binomial guy right there. So that is, you know, we, we just built some, we discussed a lot of stuff on neural networks. And then over here we um, built a couple of Poisson models using Enterprise Miner. We tricked it using a neural network. We tricked the neural network. And then we also used, this guy right here, the generalized linear model, where did it go? Right there. And we had to trick him by using the model import node. 
So you'll see what I did again. Does any well before we move away from this? Does anybody have any questions or thoughts about what they just saw today? I'm here in silence. Is my earphone dead? Uh oh, I think it is dead. Testing. Anybody hear me? No, oh, we're here. Okay, great, great, great. <laughs> okay, no questions. The only thing I wanted to the only thing I wanted to say is quickly is um, I've really enjoyed this class. Um, this is Scott, and all those, the ways you've had to stretch ourselves has been really cool. I really enjoy it. So thanks. You know what? I really appreciate that you like it, Scott. It, uh, and as a result, you don't have to pay the seventy-one dollars now. But sweet. I don't have that many <laughs> stamps. Okay, so you're off the hook. Okay, we had somebody here with a question about the PowerPoints. But no, incidentally, thank, Scott, thank you very much. That's a very, very kind thing to say. I didn't mean to diminish your compliment. Um, so let's take it all here. back. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't take compliments <laughs> well. I, they embarrass me, so that's why I make a joke when I when when I hear them. Um, okay, so Poisson, and you wanted to talk about the notes. And which which one were we talking about here? Model validation. So the so the zero inflated Poisson regression notes they have about a hundred pages. There's a model validation code on slides 94, 95. We don't need to go through every line because a lot of it is repetitive um, testing different models. But but could you just quickly run through that because there's a few different groups of code there and. Mm -hmm. It would be helpful if you could just explain to us how you've written it the way you have, because I think that's pretty important to conclude the model running this, and, and it wasn't entirely clear to me how it worked in SAS. Okay, well, here's what it is. is, is oh, okay, I see what I'm, you're doing here. So what I'm doing here is I've got a, um, I wrote a macro. So if you call this guy. Which is just a function. Find, yeah, it's, it's basically, it's a, it's a macro function here. Okay, so it's called find error, and you're going to send it a data file, and you're going to send it. Um, I don't know what p is. Let me see. So there's one, oh, one and a half, and two, and I guess p okay, are, okay, are different okay, okay. exponents for the scoring. Right. Right. Okay. And then the mean value. What's that? Oh, mean value is nothing more than what's the average. Okay. So whenever Target. I evaluate a yeah, whenever I evaluate a model, I like to evaluate the model based upon or comparing it with um, versus just taking the average. In other words, if you wanted to predict how many wins a baseball team has, you could guess, well, 81 is the average because there's 162 games, so the average team is going to win 81 games, okay? So if your model is less accurate than just guessing the 81, you really got problems. So I always use the average as a benchmark to make sure my model is at least beating that, okay? So what I have here is, if you look, um, do, where do I call the code? Right here. So I'm saying find error, here's my data file, and I wanna take it to the first power, the 1.5 power and the two power. Okay, I'm so what is the thinking behind the, those th three exponents? Because uh, I just wanted to show people that some that right now, typically in school, you learn to use the average error squared. Okay, and there's nothing magical about that squared term. Okay, if you, I, I just wanted to show you that in fact you can use different things. So. What happens is, um, incidentally, if you use a number like one, okay, well, you take everything to the first power, and what typically will happen there is if you got like a lot of like car crashes, okay, let's say we're trying to predict damages from a car. If I have something to the zero power, I mean, sorry, most people don't crash their car. Okay, so there's a big giant chunk of zeros. If I looked at how many car car damages, what will happen is, um, you know, I got a big chunk of zeros there, and if everybody's taken, if your errors are taken to the first power, 
what happens is those guys all, those zeros all gang up and they become really important. So if you get one guy who crashes his car and it costs you a million dollars, you're like, holy cow. But if you've got like 10 million customers and the rest of them never crash their car, you're like, well, those, those big chunk of zeros, if this guy's only to the one power, then what happens is um, those guys who never crash their car, those guys can overpower and diminish the effect of that one million, the guy who cost you a million bucks. Likewise, if you take things to the square power, the bigger this power is, the more those outliers become important to you. I mean, they can, they can tend to overpower this one guy that you screwed up on, the one guy who cost you a million bucks. He becomes more and more important, and he can make your value, um, your errors, um, you know, he can overpower the, the, uh, your error metrics. And then right here, I'm just saying, look, sometimes you might want to choose something in between so that one bad guy who really, really crashed his car and he drove it through a school or something. And, you know, that guy was, if you have a high exponent, he becomes really important. And if you've got a low exponent, all your good people, if you've got a ton of good people, they become important. So maybe if you take something in the middle, it kind of doesn't let either one of these guys overpower. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm just trying to show you guys that there's nothing magical about error squared. There's other things you can do. And I was just trying to show this as a demonstration. So um, what I simply did here was, um, this was, I think I was, the example was how long people take a shower. And so, um, you know, and you're trying to predict how long a person's going to be taking a shower. And then you get like, you know, your prediction minus the average, your prediction minus the Poisson model, the negative binomial, the hurdle model, all this stuff. Um, and then when we, and then, so what I did was I just calculated all these errors. I just basically had, this is the true answer. And then I also had all the predicted answers and I calculated the errors. And then I said, proc means, what am I doing? I'm just saying, what's the average value of all these guys? And then I printed them off. So. Um, you can see that when the power was one, you could see these were the various, these were the, um, you know, what was the effect of, of varying that exponent is I guess what I'm doing here. I think that was what the point of the exercise was. Is that what your question is? I've rambled here, but um, I'm, was that what you were asking? I'm guessing, is that Scott? Well, that <laughs> yeah, no, th thanks for that. So, so maybe just go back for a second. So in the first group of code, uh, you're just doing the difference. And then that is exponentiated to whatever you define P to be. In the second group right. of code, and, and, you're taking and, the mean of those that. difference calculations. Right, but would you, uh, you also have to put the, uh, the absolute value here too. Yep, that's right. So, so you have the okay. absolute value of the difference in the first set of code. In the second, you're then taking the mean of that. And then in the third, right. that's when I'm you're applying. Um, let me think. What did I do in the third? Um, proc means. Oh, 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 okay, 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 okay. Remember that I'm taking this guy to the second power, right? So I have the average squared error. But then if I want to put everybody back on the same scale, you know, if your average squared oh, error right. then you're taking was, the square root of everything back. Got it. Yeah, so, right. the, so, the, so, the, so that way I can compare them all again. I, so I want them all to be. So I guess. Yeah, so I want to, So I think you wanted to just lay this out in three steps. But I guess when I was looking at this this morning, I was wondering, couldn't you write that first group of code out of the three? You could combine these three formulas in, in one step. I'm not asking you to no, do that now, you, but. You, you, you still would have to do this guy here and take the average of all of these guys. Cause I got like 10, this guy here, it might have 10 records in it. But no, actually I had a thousand records. I had a thousand records. So what I did was I went through all 1,000 records, one at a time, and I calculated these guys for all, you know, so the first guy I read them in, and I calculated these 
six errors for the first guy. Then I read in the next guy, and I calculated these six guys for the next guy. Blah, 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 blah. Then I've got all 1,000 different people, and I've got all their errors. Then I calculated their average error of all 1,000 people. Then I set them the back. Average the average squared system. error. Right. So I, said the, so I had the average squared error, but I wanted to turn it back to the average Then you error. take the square root. Okay, I got it. And then you call it in the, in the last set of code with the macros, depending on what exponent you want. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Right. Okay. So I, I think I just put this code in here so that you guys can see that I just wanted you to understand that there's nothing magical about the average error squared, and you guys are free to do any error metric you want. This could be a logarithm. This could be anything. If it makes sense and it makes money, it's right. Okay. So just, I don't want you to ever think that there has to be some magical, I just am trying to expose you to um, mistakes that I made early in my life when I was getting out of school. I was like, oh, you know, somehow, because I only saw average error squared in my textbook, I just magically thought, well, there's something sacred and holy about it. And it took me like, you know, 20 years to figure out, oh, no, it isn't. It's just that's that's because the software, it's easier in the math. It's easier to do it that way when they're doing linear regression. That's it's just people use it because it's it's a it's a metric that's lying around after you're doing all your regressions. Um, but there's nothing magical about it. If you've got a, a one, what's one, maybe 1.5 meets your needs better. You find out what meets your needs and then you use it. So anyways, that's, that's what I got there. So do we have any other questions or comments or anything? Am no, I, am I here? Am I... your battery's low on your earpiece. So nobody, <laughs> nobody wants to ask any more questions. Good, because <laughs> my voice is ready to give out at this point anyway. So, guys, I got nothing else to tell you today. Um, gee whiz, I'm trying to think. Is there anything else that you want to talk about, or if there's anything else, call me offline and I'll and I'll and, and we can talk one on one. And um, but don't do it tonight because my earpiece is about to die. But you know, I'll be tomorrow night or whatever. Give me a holler if you got any questions. But if not, I'll post this this stuff tomorrow for you. So you're gonna yeah. you're gonna send out your your person your phone number for everybody in the class? Well it's on my it's on the syllabus for people who might have read the oh. syllabus. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, it is on the syllabus, but I've just you know that 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 was my evil twin talking just now. You guys don't even know what an evil twin is because you didn't grow up in the 70s with bad sitcoms and like bewitched and stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm back on I'm back on mute again. OK. Hey, listen, does anybody have any other final questions or comments? Oh, let's let's check the chat window before we call it a night. I'm making sure your phone number is really on the syllabus. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Let's find out. I've been Donna, I'm going to ask on one there. more question because no one else is asking questions. Um, okay, you go I, ahead. I, I have one more follow-up question about the insurance unit two assignment. Um, a okay, handful of the predictor variables uh, had this zero inflated distribution. So um, okay. I, I forget. By example, because it was a few weeks ago already, what they were, but right, a, a number of these that we're using independent variables in the logistic regression model have huge zero values, and then a, a, a regular normal distribution thereafter. Mm -hmm. How are we supposed to think about zero inflated predictor variables in the logistic model? Are we supposed to do something to them before we put them in, or because it's MLE, you just throw them in and it works? You just throw them in and let God sort them out. You don't have to, don't lose any sleep over that. And the zeros don't screw up the math like you were just giving the earlier example about zeros totally screwing up the mean or 
that it doesn't impact the model negatively? Yeah, I'm gonna wait. My my earphone's about to die, so I'm gonna put you on my speaker. One sec. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, one second here. Let me. Back, what, what I initially did when I saw those was try to separate out the zeros, like like we've done in some of these other assignments in a slightly different context, and then set up a flag for whether or not there was a zero variable. But when you throw them all in, it actually excludes that data that you've created because they're completely linearly related, right? The flag variable and, and the remaining data. So mm -hmm. I just went back to leaving it as it was. But it still seems like yeah, you know that's what? a little you can, strange. No, you don't. You don't have to worry about. The, you can have all those weird distributions. There's no requirement of it being normal or any other weird distribution. You can just throw this stuff in and and let it go. I'll, and that's because of the nature well, of the I, logistic I, I, model. I, 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 well, no, it's linear regression is the same way. Linear regression does not have a requirement that says your your input variables are normally distributed. There's no yeah. requirement of that. And yep. in fact, your target doesn't even have to be normally distributed. The only thing that has to be normally distributed in linear regression is your errors after error you're times. done. Yep. And it doesn't even matter if they aren't. If they let me give you the dirty secret here is if your error terms are not normally distributed when you're done, okay? The only thing that means is that your model, you haven't found all of the information in the data. Yep. Okay, that means that when, if you see a pattern in your error terms, you're like, hey, there's a pattern. I bet I can throw another variable in and get some, squeeze a little more information out. That's the only thing that means. Now. And, and so that was that whole point of John Tukey in that Ratner paper. You know, when Ratner talks about John Tukey, and he's like, even if you violate your assumptions and your stuff doesn't, you know, you don't have normally distributed random error terms, you still get a pretty darn good model. The only thing you're going to do is if you look at your error terms and you go, huh, there's a pattern there, well, that means that there's probably more you can do. But if you don't, and you, let's say you're under a time crunch, tell your boss, hey, look, there's, there's a pattern here. We could probably squeeze some more juice out of this lemon, but let's put this into production and let me work on the other mo the model and make it better in, in my spare time. That's what you do. All right, but we, we, it's certainly not worth losing sleep over the distribution of, of the input variables, especially if they're zero inflated in a logistic regression model. Let's put it this way. A lot of demons keep me awake at night, but zero inflated input <laughs> variables ain't one of them, okay? Fair enough. Fair enough. Thank you. Okay. So, hey, and, and here on our syllabus, for the, those of, those of my, my uh, good students who have actually read the syllabus, um, <laughs> this is, this is the, the, my, so my uh, phone number is, in fact, on here. So, so now that I've insulted half the class, you guys are going to be calling my phone at 3 in the morning and letting it ring and then hanging up, right? Please don't do that. <laughs> you would only be so lucky that we would hang up. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are going to ask me que statistics questions. <laughs> okay. Guys, I am falling asleep here. And uh, I'm on California time, so throw that in there. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>